Hey, Sun here, I'm a privacy and security researcher and you're watching the Privacy Guides. Uh, yeah, yet again, I haven't published in like 500 million years, uh, but I am here, I am back, uh, and I am very happy to say that I will now have more time, I think. Uh, <laughs> but you may be wondering, Sun, where have you been? Uh, actually, someone nailed a really funny one in the comments of last episode. I think I said in last episode, I'll be back shortly, and the person said they find shortly. Anyways, that was a lot of fun. Um, so yeah, I couldn't be more pumped today um, because I'm building a new business called Superbacked. If you watched last episode, you're aware of this. Uh, the business is really, uh, or has really developed since we last spoke, um, and it is about to launch. But for it to be a thing, um, I needed to develop an underlying piece of uh, code that Superbact would use. And that's what today's episode is about. And even though Superbact will not be open sourced, uh, this is. And I'm hoping more people will use this piece of tech. It's called BlockCrypt. Um, so yeah, there's, there's this problem, right? Um, if you've been watching the Privacy Guides for some time, you know that there's a thing called plausible deniability. Um, you may have watched the episode about um, Veracrypt. So Veracrypt is an application that is really nice and it allows one to have something called a hidden volume. So say you have some data that you want to encrypt in a way where if someone forces you to decrypt it, um, there's no way for that person to know if there are hidden secrets. I mean, that's kind of the gist of plausible deniability. It means that one cannot prove that um, that this piece of data is, is, is hidden or not. That is very useful. Um, it's a very interesting property that is very hard to achieve. In the context of Veracrypt, uh, apparently it's not perfect. Uh, and I mean, what people tend to do is, I think it's called like data forensics. There are world-class experts that are experts at figuring this stuff out. Now for average use cases, uh, such as, you know, theft or stuff like this, it's very, very useful. Now, the problem is um, it's not easy to implement. And in the context of Veracrypt, the only mainstream implementation that I am aware of, it only allows one to have one hidden volume. And if you put data in the real volume too much, it will start overwriting the hidden volume. So it's kind of very dangerous um, and it requires installing an app, uh, which means it's software based and the, the files that it generates are binary files, which mean they have to be stored on flash media or on the cloud. It's very hard to go from that format to paper. So I've been just very fascinated over the past few months um, on how can one back up really sensitive data? And that can be master passwords for password managers. That can be uh, TOTP, so 2FA recovery tokens. That can be seed phrases in the context of crypto. All of these secrets that one wants to back up in a very secure way, and we cannot put them in the password manager because they are backups of those things. Um, and typically speaking, we want to put those backups on a medium that has a very high level of resilience and persistence. Uh, and one of the best uh, is, iron oh, ironically, paper. Uh, paper is really great. Now, obviously, paper can get wet. That's why what you see here is actually laminated. Uh, and paper can burn. That's why you want to have copies of this. But the really cool thing is what you're seeing here, this little block is encrypted and it would probably cost over a billion dollars to attack it, if even possible, depending on if you use Shamir Secret Sharing. Um, but yet again, as secure as this may be once encrypted, um, it did not have plausible deniability, meaning you can take data, encrypt it, and output it as a QR code. But if you're forced to decipher this um, by design, that's how encryption works. You enter the key and you get you know, text out of the ciphertext. And that's really problematic because it doesn't give you plausible deniability. What if, conceptually speaking, one could store more than one secret inside of a paper backup. And that is something I was completely obsessed about. So this episode, I wanna keep it kind of mainstream. At the end, I'm gonna explain how I implemented this in the context of BlockCrypt. It's gonna get really nerdy. 
Um, but before we get there, I kind of want to show how that works uh, kind of high level. And I am really, really excited to say that um, I think I put together an implementation that uses cryptographic fundamentals. I did not reinvent the wheel. It's just a very simple piece of code that all of you guys can implement in your own tech if you wish. And it's by design uh, or it offers by design some plausible deniability. If you are a cryptographer or if you know one, if you're a student at a university, one of your teachers is a cryptographer, please have this peer reviewed. I'll link to it down there in the description. We need to have as many brains as possible on this to make sure that it's solid and hopefully to make sure that it does provide world-class data forensics uh, plausible deniability. So thanks to everyone who will uh, contribute to this. And by the way, if you have a GitHub account and you like the project, smash that star, uh, hoping this, project's, uh, this project gets uh, a little more scrutiny. So um, without further ado, let's, let's go down the rabbit, bowl, uh, the rabbit hole of BlockCrypt a little bit. So um, BlockCrypt really came down from this idea that in the context of hardware wallets, uh, for instance, you can have BIP39, it's a seed extension. It's a fabulous way of having multiple wallets with an ephemeral key, which means essentially that if you don't enter that key or if you enter another one, it's a different wallet. So that by design gives you plausible deni uh, deniability. And it's really one of the great uh, pieces of fundamentals in the Bitcoin ecosystem that made its way to pretty much all other cryptos. Um, I mentioned Veracrypt a bit earlier. Veracrypt is a fabulous app that I use for my backups. There's a few guides uh, on the privacy guides about Veracrypt. I'll link to them uh, down there in the description. It's amazing, but as I mentioned earlier, uh, it only has one hidden volume um, and that hidden volume is kind of delicate. You can overwrite it by mistake. So from a user experience perspective, not great. And also uh, you cannot really you know, do paper backups. And that's the thing with hardware wallets, you can have BIP39, but how do you back it up? Well, you can't because you didn't exist. There was no way of encrypting multiple secrets with different passphrases inside of a paper backup. So um, plausible deniability is something that is really important. It's one of those really fundamental properties that is crucial if someone is uh, backing up sensitive data. It might be corporate data where if ever someone goes to an employee and forces them to reveal a secret, well, there could be like a, you know, a secret, but then the real one is, is hidden, which is very practical. Um, so as I just showed, this is the block that I showed, maybe it wasn't very visible on camera, um, but that block essentially has one main secret and two hidden secrets, and that's super cool. So if we have a look here at secret number one, uh, it's a classic you know, 24 word mnemonic, uh, and it's uh, encrypted using this passphrase. Um, so now for pretty much all backup solutions that I'm aware of, that would be it. One secret, one passphrase, and that's it. Now, what if there was a piece of code that one could use to then add a secret number two, which is this is a test, line break, yo, and that is protected or encrypted using this passphrase. And what if we could go even beyond what Veracrypt allowed one to do, and we could have a third secret, and that one's protected with a third passphrase. Um, I feel like that would open up a whole bunch of really cool use cases that were not possible until now. Um, so how does this work? And now this is really the nerdy part, but please bear with me. I'm gonna show how this work and demo super backed in a second. Um, but I do wanna explain a little bit how it works so that if some of you wanna have a look at the code and kind of help me peer review it, that would be amazing. So the way it works is, um, Blockcrypt will generate uh, an IV, it will also generate a salt, and it will generate headers and data. So all headers and data share the same salt. Um, and in the context of headers, uh, the way it works essentially is uh, it has a predetermined uh, header size, or what I call a block size. In this case, by default, it's 64 bytes. So essentially, within that 64 bytes, uh, everything's encrypted using uh, AES-256 CBC, meaning that each little block here is 16 bytes long, uh, essentially the length or the size of its IV, which is 128 bits. 
So header one is protected by password one, header two is protected by password two, header three is protected by password three. And since all those different passwords are non-deterministic, it means that when you try a password, it will parse all of the length of those four headers and it will try to find a match. And it does this very, very fast given uh, the default block size is not very large. So we're talking milliseconds here. So if you enter password one, uh, it will then reveal essentially a, a secret, which here is the position of related data within data. So I'll show what that means in a second. This is another position and this is another position. The second little integer there is the data length at that position. So what that means here in the context of data, it means that from the headers, we know that there's a piece of encrypted data with the same passphrase, this time encrypted using AES-256 GCM, uh, which means we have a 96-bit uh, initialization vector, uh, and it uses the same shared salt essentially, but it does uh, generate the IV randomly. So essentially, it, the headers say, hey, you know, go at length zero, and there's a piece of data that's 156 bytes long. So this is what we see here. And that is encrypted using the same password one uh, as we had in the headers. Now the IV is also generated randomly and an auth tag is generated. So uh, this encryption scheme is authenticated, meaning no one can uh, you know, play around with the data. It won't work. Now the second header says, you know, now go all the way to you know, byte length 184. This is here. And there we'll have data two protected or encrypted by password two. Again, random IV and the auth tag that matches. And then this, the third one is actually very short. That's essentially yo. Um, well, we have the little piece of data here and the other IV and auth tag. What I forgot to mention earlier in the context of the headers is the block size in the context of headers is fixed. And in the context of the data, it's dynamic by design. You can have a look at the source code essentially, but it's twice as long as the first data block rounded to the upper 64 byte uh, block. I mean, it's kind of technical, but you can have a look at the source code, which means that everything left in the block size is filled up with random, uh, random or cryptographically random padding. Uh, that means that theoretically speaking, and that's my understanding, and that's the part that I want to have peer reviewed by you guys, um, it's if you don't know the password, so P1, P2, or P3, it's impossible to know if any of this stuff here is random panning or ciphertext because it all looks the same. That's the part that I would really like to have peer reviewed and hopefully someone that's deeply involved in data forensics could you know, help out here. Um, so what that allows one to do is when we use Superbact, which uses Blockcrypt uh, under the hood, well, if you enter a passphrase, it will be able, like magic, to figure out all of this and extract a secret that's uh, you know relating to that passphrase. And that's for any of the three. And if you enter a passphrase that just matches nothing, uh, it will just not work. Um, so that's the GitHub URL. I'll link it down there in the description. You can also play around with it using npm install, Blockcrypt. Uh, until it's peer reviewed, it is under beta. So yeah, I mean, I'm really hoping that some of you will, will have a look and this is what the, websites, uh, the website looks like on GitHub. Uh, the whole piece of code, there are also uh, unit tests, but the whole piece of code, I don't remember, yeah, it's 204 lines. So it's something that is like, extra, oh yeah, and there's a lot of like, you know, inline documentation. So it's even less, I think it's around 150 lines. So yeah, I would love for you guys to, you know, let me know how, how what you think about this. I mean, hopefully it's good. Um, now, the way it works in Superback, just to demo it, if you pop open Superback, uh, I'm gonna remove my little webcam cover here, and if you uh, press recover, I can then scan this, boop, and enter a passphrase, uh, and depending on the passphrase, you'll get one of the secrets. So if we have a look here at the code, uh, sorry, if we go back and I look at the tests here, uh, if I enter lip gift uh, name next sixth, uh, we are going to get that initial mnemonic. But if we recover again, and this time uh, we put the password for yo, um, well, <clears throat> we're gonna get yo. Uh, so that's super crazy. I mean, 
this, I think, will, again, enable use cases that one was never able to um, fulfill before. I would love to know what you think about this, by the way, in the uh, comments down there. So uh, looking at the Superback website really quickly, um, Superback is the first app that leverages BlockCrypt. 100% uh, of the user base of, Block, uh, of Superback sorry, will use BlockCrypt, meaning all users of Superback, even if they don't need plausible deniability, they will be using it. And that means that as the user base grows, it's going to allow everyone to benefit from that plausible deniability, which is uh, something that I find really important. Um, by the way, Superbacked, uh, if you go on the website, it's pretty neat. Uh, you can kind of have a sense of what the app does. Uh, and also you can kind of see who's behind the project. Uh, there's a great team of advisors, so it's me developing it essentially, but there's you know a real whole bunch of world-class advisors helping me out. Um, and if you're as pumped as I am about this and you wanna know uh, when it's released and get a discount, uh, drop your email there and I'll get in touch as soon as it's ready. Um, so yeah, so that's some of the stuff that I've been up to. I mean, it's just been a blast. I really went down the rabbit hole. I'm going to be publishing more episodes on why Superback is secure. Um, I will be selling the app, so I guess it's sponsored by myself in a way. Um, but all of the mindset that's gone into it, all of the advice that I've received from world-class experts all over the world, um, all of this is something that I want to share with you because it's been such a fascinating learning experience. And all of this has gone into a product that I think will uh, be so helpful for so many of us. So yeah, that's all I have for you today. I'll see you soon. Bye.